At the time I'm recording this video, I am freezing to death in my apartment because the heater is broken and Texas decided to get unreasonably cold. What are you doing, Texas? My thermostat isn't even registering the temperature, but my educated guess is that my living room has somehow reached absolute zero. Yeah, so naturally the icy weather has me thinking a lot about the comic book criminals of the cold, villains who flourish in frost and embody below zero badness. And there's no Arctic arch nemesis more well known than Mr. Freeze if we're being honest, but aside from him, you know, there's Captain Cold, my shiny silver medal. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and if you're not familiar, Captain Cold has been one of the Flash's more active adversaries since his debut all the way back in 1957. A victim of parental abuse and the grandson of an ice truck worker, Leonard Snart turned to a life of small-time thievery until the Scarlet Speedster subdued him and his partners in crime. Snart later developed a cold gun capable of freezing Flash dead in his tracks and became Captain Cold, the man who mastered Absolute Zero. And from that instant, from these opening pages of the character's creation, Captain Cold was infused with fascinating science, history, and culture that you may have missed. Like, look at his goggles, for example. It looks like Doctor Doom's mask, but somehow even more limiting? Well, where did this design come from? Well, if you are a subscriber of this channel, hint hint, you know that nothing in comics is ever born in a vacuum, and Captain Cold's slitted specs are no exception. Long, long ago, natives of Arctic North America were dealing with one of Mother Nature's many obstacles. They lived in an environment that featured both heavy snow and clear skies in the springtime, like a Bob Ross painting. God was having a good day when he made Alaska. And while it seems like a pleasant environment on the canvas, the mixture of the bright, harsh ultraviolet sunlight reflecting off of the white snow was not a very safe combination. It had the potential to damage your retinas, causing a condition known as snow blindness. The Inuit were one group of people who witnessed this issue firsthand millennia ago and forged specialized spectacles to combat the elements and protect their peepers. It may look simple, but there's a lot going on here in these snow goggles to reduce the amount of light entering their eyeballs. In addition to the small slitted openings, the form-fitting design, made from leather, wood, ivory, bone, or whatever else they had available, curved around the wearer's head, fitting tightly to the face and preventing light from bleeding in from the sides or the top. And as an extra measure, the insides of these goggles were often coated with soot to reduce glare even further. This eyewear allowed the Inuit and other groups like the Aleuts and the Yupik to maneuver in danger dangerously bright environments without risking snow blindness. Not only that, but it also has the added benefit of focusing one's vision. These narrow openings function much like how you might squint to focus on something far away. The light bouncing off of the object that you're trying to observe is competing with all this other light bouncing off everything else in your field of view. It's like unwanted visual noise crowding your sight. By squinting, or by wearing these snow goggles, a smaller amount of focused light enters your eye, keeping out light from the periphery, leading to a slight improvement in vision. And of course, there is one last benefit to these slitted spectacles. I kind of think they look cool. And I'm not alone there. When Captain Cold premiered in the late 1950s, these snow goggles were in the midst of their transformation from a utility to an accessory. Early vehicle drivers wore an industrial metal version of these goggles to protect their eyes from glare and dust, which evolved further into sun visors in the 1930s and slitted specs in the 1950s. Eventually, the eyewear was introduced as part of the mod or space age fashion movement in the 60s and 70s when they were redesigned to look more futuristic. And the same basic design and principle continued on to modern day in one one way or another. Leonard Snart, fashion icon. What a legend. Do you get it? Cause he was the legends of tomorrow. In the comics, however, the reason that Captain Cold wears these goggles is to protect his eyes from the flash of his gun. Yeah, it turns out the glare from the cold gun firing off is strong enough to affect one's vision, but interestingly, the icy temperatures it produces affects eyes in a surprisingly different way. You see, Snart's gun had another ability back in the early days of Flash comics, a power that seems to have been forgotten and thrown away, likely due to how weird it is. Captain Cold could create insane arctic mirages, which coincidentally was also the name of my mid-2000s alternative indie band, We Were Terrible. These offensive mirages were once a staple of Captain Cold's attack strategy. Disorient the Flash by creating mirages of weird beasts or uh, aggressive staircases? Then try to escape or incapacitate the speedster before he snaps out of it. And believe it or not, this tactic has a tiny bit of real world science on its side. Mirages often occur because of temperature gradients in the atmosphere that bend light rays causing 
distant objects to appear displaced. You know how a really hot day can make it seem like there are puddles of water on the ground when there really aren't? That's because the hot air rising from the scorching pavement collides with the cooler air above it. The light passing between the boundary of the warm and cool air can affect our perception. In this case, patches of the sky appear low to the ground like puddles of water. That's an example of an inferior mirage, where the illusory image appears below the real object. But what happens if that was inverted? If there was cold air lying closer to the ground that met the warmer air above it? Well, that is called a temperature inversion and can occur in freezing environments. Like, you know, when everything around you is being shot by a cold gun. The mirages that this inversion can create are called superior mirages. Instead of the mirage appearing lower than the real object, it looms higher, like land masses or boats floating in the sky. Objects below the horizon can become magically visible. But okay, how much damage could these superior mirages actually do, right? They just slightly change how an image is perceived. Well, according to historian Tim Moulton, this kind of mirage may have been responsible for one of the biggest tragedies in history, the sinking of the Titanic. Malton proposes that on the night the ship sank, the weather may have created an optical illusion that obscured the iceberg behind a superior mirage of a false horizon. Quote, at night, the miraging on the horizon appears like a narrow bank of haze due to light scattering in the very long air path over the unusual distance you can see for and the trapping of light in a duct beneath the inversion. Titanic's lookouts notice this apparent haze around the horizon despite the remarkable clarity of the night, and they testified that the fatal iceberg appeared to come out of this haze at the last moment, end quote. Tragically, as we all know, the crew did not see the iceberg until it was too late. But the effect of the superior mirage continued to prove its dangerous nature. A nearby ship by the name of the SS Californian was attempting to find the sinking Titanic and rescue its passengers. And it absolutely could have, except the mirages also downplayed the Titanic's size, making it appear smaller and closer to witnesses than it actually was. Captain Stanley Lord of the Californian saw the vessel, but didn't believe it was the Titanic because it looked too little. Passengers of the Titanic could have been saved or heck even just continued their journey without a single hitch, but a string of Arctic mirages may have sealed their fates. These cold mirages are real and they can be dangerous, in a passive sense anyway. They can be hazardous and manipulative, sure, but they can't create brand new imagery that isn't already there. They can make boats look like they're floating in the sky, but they can't make someone see a boat that doesn't exist. And that makes it a far cry from the colorfully wild images that the comics showcased. Get it? Showcased. Either way, this forgotten ability seems to deal more in hallucinations than mirages, which are very distinctly different things. Plus, I feel like giving Captain Cold the power to create these mind-bending images kind of distracts from the fact that his gun already has one of the strongest abilities in the universe, the power to slow all atomic motion to an effective dead stop. After all, Captain Cold is the man who mastered Absolute Zero, and that's what makes him the perfect counter to the Flash. They're opposites of one another. I mean, yeah, there's already Reverse Flash, and boy, even the first villain that Barry Allen faced off against was coined the slowest man on Earth. The Flash writers just really love this theme of opposites when they're crafting villains, but whatever. The point is, Captain Cold is Flash's atomic opposite. Let me explain. So we all know that the source of Snart's supervillainy comes from his lethal cold gun, which he constructed using a device called a cyclotron. He actually got the idea in the original comics thanks to a newspaper article which theorized that a cyclotron could effectively interfere with Flash's speed, which raises a completely different question. Is that a regular thing for journalists to do in a world full of superheroes? Publish comprehensive theories about their weaknesses for the public to consume? That doesn't seem very smart. Back on track, if you look at Captain Cold shooting off his weapon, it may look like he's firing out ice or some other kind of frosty ammunition, but cold is not a physical substance that he can shoot at the flash. It's a little more complicated than that. Heat is really just the kinetic movement of molecules in a substance. When atoms start quivering, you stop shivering. However, when the particles start to move relatively slowly, you feel that lack of energy as cold. But Snart's weapon is more powerful than like a misting fan on a hot day. It somehow has the ability to freeze its targets down, way down, to apparently a temperature of negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. This is known as absolute zero, the point at which the particles that make up an object have minimal vibrational motion. There's always gonna be some 
some kind of kinetic energy, and the lowest possible level in a quantum system is called its zero-point energy, which does remind me of another villain I want to talk about someday. Zero-point energy. Yeah, I save the best inventions for myself. The cold gun isn't putting cold into whatever it shoots at. Much like the thief Snart himself, the beam from the cold gun is stealing from its targets, robbing each molecule of its vibrational energy. Compare that to The Flash, where a considerable part of the Scarlet Speedster's kit is that he can vibrate molecules of himself and objects that he touches fast enough to phase through matter and even entire dimensions. What greater nemesis for the monarch of motion than a man who has the ability to bring all motion on an atomic level to a near stop? From the cultural origins of his costume, to the science of his long-since-forgotten arctic mirage powers, and even being the atomic opposite of the fastest man alive, Captain Cold is just plain cool. You get it? Cool. There is so much that we didn't even talk about in regards to Captain Cold, like the cold fields that he projects to passively slow the Flash, or the really interesting way that his abilities differ from that of Mr. Freeze, so I will leave that up to you guys to discuss down in the comments below. I know a ton of other YouTubers are like begging for likes or subscribers, but honestly, all I really want are lots of comments. I, I enjoy reading your guys' comments, you guys are so smart, and it really makes my day every time we upload a new video, and I get to see what everyone's reaction is, everyone who has better ideas that I could have possibly hoped for, you guys are incredible. So thank you to everyone who does leave comments on our videos, it means a lot to me. Uh, and if you're new to the channel, we do make videos that explore the history, science, philosophy, and culture hidden inside of comic books and superheroes every single week, so hit that big sexy subscribe button if you want, so you never miss an upload, and tap that bell icon to join the notification squad so we can chat in the comments as soon as new videos go live, that sounds pretty rad. And as always, I want to give a huge thanks to our patrons, especially Christopher Lang, Keaton Lamper, Elizabeth Monsell, Everett Parrott, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who keep this show alive in the face of YouTube's ridiculous changes over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. If you want more superhero science, click or tap right here to watch our video about if Superman could really crush coal into diamond, or you can click right down here for something YouTube's mysterious algorithm thinks you'll enjoy. I don't know how it works, I'm dumb. Thank you guys so much for watching, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya.